Shalom Torah fans. Since January of 2017, I received several calls from Nehemia Gordon, who was breaking new ground in biblical research that, that I felt needed to get out to the world. And so before he left for Israel, he and I got together for Shabbat Night Live to pre-record a series which we released this last fall, and the Gentiles shall know my name. I didn't get to watch this series until it actually aired on television, and at the end of this series, I was so moved by this, I wanted to call Nehemia immediately and say, Nehemia, I need an update. When can you come and, and spend some time? Just come and, and, and uh, relax and, and be here in Charlotte. And he said, I'm busy. I, I'm on, on some projects right now that I can't leave at this point. And so just a couple of weeks ago, he gave me a call which I, I, I will never forget because uh, what, what happened during this last year and what he had been working on for the last several months has really been a historic event in the history of Bible research. And things that have not been known for over a thousand years have now come to light. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have Nehemia Gordon back with us. Nehemia, good to have you here, finally, Michael, at last. It's great to be here, great to be back. Yeah, it really was exciting when I called you up. And, and what had happened is uh, we started about a year ago uh, looking for more Bible manuscripts with the full vowels of the name Yehovah. We started out, uh, you know, in 2001, I had two Bible manuscripts. And then uh, over the years, I found a third and a fourth and a fifth. And so in a period of about 15 years, I knew about five Bible manuscripts with the vowels Yehovah. Okay, now there are a lot of people, as the, mm -hmm. I, I believe it's hundreds of thousands that have joined us since the mm -hmm. episodes have aired. Yeah. And so let, let's go back and, and capture yeah. some of these things because there were things that you laid out uh, in the last series that mm -hmm. I, I think we need to revisit, but, but the significance of, of this as far as the vowels in the name. Can you give us a little background right, on so that? Right, in, so in, in most of the Bible manuscripts, manuscripts, or he, what we've been told for 200 years is that God's name is Yahweh. And, and the Jews forgot how to pronounce the name, and these Christians rediscovered this pronunciation Yahweh, uh, or I should say they invented really this pronunciation Yahweh about 200 years ago. And when I was studying this many, many years ago, I said, you know, there's this theory of Yahweh. And I looked up in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, which is really a respected source, and it refer, said Yahweh is a scholarly guess. And I said, guess, surely we should be able to do better than that. And I started to pick apart and what are the sources? How do we really know it's Yahweh? And I saw there really was nothing in any Jewish or Hebrew source that, that supported that. And so I started to, to, to look for sources that would be Jewish sources. And I really you know, didn't even know where to go and uh, kind of stumbled upon some things while I was uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem working on my master's degree. And should I tell this story? It's, it's a... What I've well, shared before. I think, uh, um, I think you need to because yeah. uh, why this name uh, is significant, it, yeah. it appears how many times well, in the, the Hebrew? The name appears 6,827 times in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament. That means yud heh vav -Hey, God's holy name appears more than Lord, God, uh, which is Adonai, Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, beautiful titles, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But if you combine all of those together, they don't even come out to half of the actual personal name of God. And in Exodus 3.15, he says, this is my name forever. This is, it's usually translated, this is my memorial for generation to generation, like, like some memorial plaque and he's dead or something. But if you look at the Hebrew, it actually means this is my mention for generation to generation. So this is what we are first, what we're supposed to call him by his name, yud heh vav -Hey, revealed in Exodus 3.15. And the problem was, for the last 200 years, scholars said, we really don't know what the name is. And let me back up. Jews have this tradition of not speaking the name. Okay, that's, and, that's where it right. started. That's, so that's where it they starts. They don't speak it. Right. And we, Jews don't speak it. I grew up that whenever you see those four letters, 6,827 times in your Bible, thousands of times in the prayer books and other things, you're always to read them as Adonai. Adonai means Lord. This is a tradition that goes back at least 1,800 years. Some people claim longer. And because of that, it was assumed that Jews don't know what the pronunciation is. Um, my prayer, well, and, and so we were told these are the vowels of Adonai. Well, 
I started studying Hebrew manuscripts. My prayer was to know what is your name based on Hebrew Jewish sources that on the day of judgment, I could point to that sort. If God says to me, Nehemia, you mispronounced my name. Why did you do that? I'll be able to say, Father in heaven, who I'm standing before right now on the day of judgment, this is how it was recorded by the scribes who preserved your word. And I love your word and I believe in your word. And it was in your very word that I found your name written there. I couldn't find Yahweh anywhere in any Hebrew or Jewish source. So now on the other hand, I didn't know how to pronounce the name. I was told that the name is the vowels of Adonai. And okay, I so the yod Hey vav Hey uh, mm-hmm. that you were told, and this is what's uh, taught in American oh. Christian cemetery, <laughs> uh, that uh, yod Hey vav Hey the, the vowels are the yeah. vowels of Adonai. Well, and I was taught that at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Okay. Not just at Christian seminaries. Um, and this is in the grammars of, of biblical Hebrew. The main grammar of biblical Hebrew is written by a German guy named Gazinius in the 1800s. And to this day, it's the definitive grammar of biblical Hebrew. People have modified and approved upon it, but basically that's the basis of modern biblical grammars. And Gazinius established that the name was Yahweh. What did he base it on? I think we'll get that to that in a, in, in a, in a future episode. Uh, okay, but, well, well, you're gonna show us the source where that came from, We're gonna right? actually get to the source, yeah. But, but before we get to that, so 17 years ago, I'm sitting minding my own business and I have this job at the Hebrew University and I'm proofreading the Bible. And as I'm proofreading the Bible, uh, I, had, I had already seen that it doesn't, the name yud heh doesn't have the vowels of Adonai, which made no sense because I was told this as a fact. It was common knowledge. It's in Gazinius, the biblical Hebrew grammar. Everyone knows those are the vowels of Adonai, but I open up the manuscripts and not only is it not of the vowels of Adonai, but it's missing one of the three vowels. And how do I know it's missing a vowel? Well, there's certain rules of Hebrew grammar and, and phonology and pronunciation. If you have those four letters, you have to have at least three vowels or at least vowel symbols. And so th- there's a, a vowel symbol that's missing. And I realized, wait, if I can know what that vowel symbol is, I, I'm, maybe that's the name. And there I am minding my own business and I'm proofreading the Bible and I've got a stack of photographs of the Aleppo Codex, the most accurate copy of the Bible in existence and, it, and this it, is what the shrine of the book is protecting, right. the, the nuclear proof vault. Right. Well, the shrine of the book this. Has, has two pages on display and the rest of it's in the vault, mm-hmm. along with the Dead Sea Scrolls at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. But I have photographs, one-to-one you know, color photographs, and I'm checking every jot and tittle, and all of a sudden I find a place where one of the, those vowels that's supposed to be missing isn't missing. And there's a full set of vowels, and I can read the name the way it's written, because the way it's normally written in most Bible manuscripts, and today I can tell you, because I know about the name in over 1,000 Bible manuscripts, most Bible manuscripts, about 80% of the Bible manuscripts we've looked at don't have this uh, missing vowel, meaning it's missing in those vowels, in, mm. in, in, in those manuscripts. Right. And even the ones that, don't ha- that do have it, you usually don't have it. In other words, you'll, the name 6,827 times, Aleppo Codex only has those full vowels seven times. Hmm. which means the rest of the places that, that it's, it's missing. missing. And why is that? Because the scribes don't want us to pronounce this Deliberately name. Deliberately missing. It, absolutely. Mm-hmm. By design, they left out the middle vowel so Jews wouldn't accidentally, you'd come across that word and you wouldn't accidentally pronounce it. That was their, their, what they were doing. And every once in a while, they slipped up and they put in the full vowels. They put in that missing vowel. Why'd they do that? It's kind of like when you're maybe texting and you're thinking of the certain word in your head and you, and you, and you type a word that sounds like that. It happens to me all the time. I write there instead of there, right? Um, and or two, two, and two. And well, so they're writing it, right? And uh, they slip up and they put in the full vowels. And they didn't do it often, right? Seven times out of thousands of times is not a lot at all. And the Aleppo Codex, it's about, uh, it's seven times. And the Leningrad Codex, about 50 times. That was the other one I had 17 years ago. Um, so over the years, I amassed more. I've got five manuscripts uh, a little over a year ago. And then I start to look for more. And and I shared in the Gentiles should know my name about how I found 16 rabbis who said that the name explicitly said the name is Yehovah, right? So we were told right. this myth. It was, it's a myth that the Jews don't know how to pronounce the name. And I found out, well, the Jews think they know how to pronounce the name at the very least. And no one will talk about this in, in, in the scientific literature, in the academic literature. You'll look in the encyclopedias and in the journal articles, they won't say anything about, well, the Jews thought they knew how to pronounce the name, but they were wrong. And here's our reason. They don't even address it because they don't even know about it. So we have 16 rabbis who say the name is Yehovah. And then I had only five Bible manuscripts. I felt a little awkward there. I have only five Bible, I need more Bible manuscripts. My goal, Michael, was to get to 10 Bible manuscripts. And I thought if I worked for the rest of my life, I might get to 10. 
And instead, now I have over 1,000, which is, it's a miracle. And, and I, I don't want to talk about more of that in, in, a, in a future episode, the miracle. But, but, I, but in a way, this brings me full circle back to something that we started out many years ago. You know, so this is looking at the name Yehovah in the Old Testament, in what I call the Tanakh, that's my Bible. Mm -hmm. And you came to me with an issue in, in the New Testament, your Bible, and asked me a question. And that now can come full circle and teach us also something about the name in, in my Bible. But can we, can we go back to that, what the original problem was? Well, I, this is one of the most significant things in my life. I was yeah. living in Jerusalem, and we had a, a young man that was uh, attending uh, one of the yeshivas. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a believer. He's the son of a pastor from the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, his father, I woke up to the Hebrew roots of the faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so now, uh, years later, his son is coming over mm -hmm. and attending a yeshiva, and uh, week by week, it just kept on getting more bizarre. And I saw the, this young man uh, as he was attempting to follow what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew. And this, this was his, his reasoning uh, for doing what he was doing. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is something I, I brought up to you. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. uh, it, it says, uh, uh, th this is uh, really uh, uh, two days before the, the Passover uh, in, in which Yeshua was crucified. Then spake Jesus, I'm reading King James, to the multitude. This is Matthew 23. And his disciples. This is Matthew 23, and this is in verse two here. Mm -hmm. uh, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid or command you to observe, that observe and do. Mm -hmm. And so he was in his heart wanting to follow what, what Yeshua, what Jesus said to do. So, so this man believes in Yeshua and he's Jewish and he's saying, hey, I should actually do what Yeshua said to do and obey the Pharisees. Cause, right. Because they sit in the seat of Moses. Right, and so he was up every morning at 4.30 in the morning, davening at the wall. He was doing oh. all these things. Mm -hmm. And and when he would come over for Shabbat dinner, then he would start bringing up, well, if we, we eat this first, uh, and, uh, and, and this is really encoded in this book, you may be familiar with oh, it, yeah. uh, Guide to Blessings. If you eat this first, then you must say this blessing, but if you eat more of this other thing, <laughs> then you say this blessing, but, but, and, and, yeah. and, and it was just, just, yeah. just mincing on things mm. that if Yeshua really said to do this, and I I watched the light go out in, in this young man's eyes. It's mm -hmm. like he got so confused by, mm -hmm. by these things. Yeah. And you were raised as a rabbinic Jew. Yeah, my, my father was an Orthodox rabbi. I was raised as a modern day Pharisee. And I was, I mean, this was just common uh, daily life. If you ate an apple, you made a certain blessing over the apple. Bore priha eats. Blessed is the one who creates the fruit. Beautiful thing, right? Until you realize, I want a snack, and now I've got to start thinking, do I eat this thing first or that thing first? And which blessing do I make on it? Um, and it becomes part of, uh, it really it becomes a, a major part of everyday life. So you sit down for a snack, and you've got an apple, and you've got a glass of water, and you, so you make one blessing over the apple, a different blessing over the water, and then you want bread. So now you get up and you wash your hands according to a certain ritual and you make the blessing over the washing the hands that God commanded us to wash the hands. And then you sit down and you make uh, you know, the, the, uh, the blessing over the hamotzi lechem in haaretz, the blessing over the bread. And now if I had done the bread first, the blessing over the bread covers all the other foods. And so I don't need to that. So now I've made extra blessings. So now it becomes a strategic question. What do I eat first? And it's ridiculous. And, and growing up, I, I remember thinking like, God can't care what I eat first. That can't be like, this is, I don't find this in the Bible. I was looking in the Torah, in the five books of Moses. And I was saying to my rabbis, you're spending all day teaching me which blessings to make and all kinds of rules and which shoe to put on first in the morning, all kinds of rules and regulations. That's not in our Torah. And they'd say, well, it's in the oral Torah that there was this teachings of the Pharisees, these takanot that I talk about in the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. And I ended up writing a book about it. I didn't sit, set out to write a book. Yeah. I set out to answer your question that you came to me with saying, yeah, how th this, could this is the book that, yeah. uh, that uh, answers my yeah. questions. Right. And, and uh, right, exactly. Brilliantly. 
Well, and, and it really started out with you coming to me saying, hey, uh, Yeshua seems to be saying, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Sure sounds like he's saying to obey the Pharisees. Well, and yeah, and when I was doing this research, of course, I didn't actually know what a Moses' seat is because we don't have those anymore in modern day synagogues. So I had a background in archeology. span My bachelor's degree was in archeology. span And uh, people can see here, this is a Moses' seat at Chorazin in Israel. That, that's right. It was actually that, discovered in excavation. So they mm -hmm. did have it 2,000 years ago. And you can read about it in some of the rabbinical literature. They make references to it. And it turns out what they would do is they would stand in the synagogue and read from the scroll of scripture. And after, and you see Yeshua did that in, in the Gospel of Luke. That's right. He read Isaiah chapter 61. Mm -hmm. And then after the reading, the rabbi would sit in this chair and he would say, hey, what we just read this is what it means, and you have to accept my interpretation. And so the one who sits in the seat of Moses, that is sitting in the seat of authority. That's what it means in that historical context. Once I found this out, I said, wow, Michael, this really is a problem. Yeah. In other yeah, words, from the let, New Testament let, perspective. Yeah, and let me give you a little, little more background yeah. on that, because, see, I had this question because, um, because I saw this man's mm -hmm. life change yeah. and it was changing for the worst mm -hmm. and what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I felt responsible for it. I felt, okay. felt responsible be, uh, for his father and, and for, for him. And I was really praying about this. And I, I said, and there is no way that Yeshua said this, mm -hmm. and, and I knew I couldn't talk to any Christians or Christian ministers and say, there's no way that Yeshua couldn't have said something that's in the King James Version <laughs> of the Bible because I'd be tarred and feathered well, the uh, other, by, the, by the doing other issue, that. The other issue is I think most Christians will read that and say, well, that was only up to the crucifixion, now that's done away with. We don't actually have to follow what Jesus said. It was oh, nailed oh, to the that, cross. That, that's right. And here you had somebody who was Jewish who was saying, hey, I wanna follow the Torah, and instead of following the Torah, he ends up, uh, obsessing about, do I eat the apple first or drink the water first? Because that depends on which blessing I say, Definitely. right? I mean, and, and saying, well, Yeshua told me to follow the Pharisees and obey what, you know, because they sit in the seat of Moses. They've got the chair of authority. So, I, so, so in other words, when, he was, when this man maybe was a Christian, he didn't have to worry about this because all the law was nailed to the cross. Now that you're trying to follow the Torah, well, the Pharisees tell us a lot of things about how to follow the Torah. Do we have to obey them? And it sure sounds like it from this verse. And, and so here's what I did, which to me was just like, it made sense. Let's see what other manuscripts say, because this is what I do. I look at manuscripts. This is what I've been trained to do at the Hebrew University for, for decades. Um, at the time, this was uh, I, I, you know, many years ago, so I look in the Greek manuscripts. I don't, as far as I could tell, at least from what was documented, all the Greek manuscripts had the same thing. There yeah. wasn't any difference. I think I said at the time, every extant Greek manuscript says basically the same thing right, right. there. At least, and, at least and I was yeah. I was lost. I couldn't go any yeah. further mm. with with uh, with my resources, with my skills, but yeah. I knew you to be mm. an honest scholar mm. and that when I ask you questions, if you didn't have the answers, you would you would dig and yeah, you I went, to find you out. went on a digging expedition yeah. that resulted in in what we're going to be able to share with uh, with everyone yeah. during this series yeah. but uh but, but, but what happened, the, well, the so, initial thing? So initially what I found was, a, uh, you can see it here, this is a section from the British Library manuscript of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. What? So it turns out there's this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew that was preserved by Jewish rabbis. That's right. And yeah. here it says, this yeah. is uh, section 97, it's divided differently, but it's the same, same words. And it says, As diber Yeshua el ha'am el tamidav, then Yeshua spoke to the people and to the, uh, his disciples, they more, al kise Moshe Yeshua perushim v'achachamim, upon the seat of Moses sit the Pharisees and the sages, and now all that he says to you, diligently do. In other words, what's their claim to authority? That they sit on the seat of Moses. Therefore, do what Moses says, which is, I mean, so brilliant. And it kind of reminds you of where, you know, they say, Who, should we pay our taxes? Well, whose face is on that coin? Caesar, so give it to Caesar, right? What, mm -hmm. What's the name of that chair they sit in? It's the seat of Moses. So do what he says. Do what Moses says, not what the people in the chair say, which is incredible. Like, like what, a, what a brilliant answer. And you'd never guess, I'd never have guessed this in a million years based on what I read in the King James Version, based on what I read in the Greek. And here we find it in Hebrew manuscript. So I'd found this in a Hebrew manuscript. This was published originally by George Howard in 1987. And he knew about nine manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. 
two of his manuscripts read exactly this way. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's got to be more manuscripts. So I start digging for more manuscripts. Now, um, I'm not sure I want to get to what I found there first. I, I think I want to I want to share something a little. Uh, uh, one of the really interesting things that came up. So as I'm looking at this Hebrew Matthew, I'm like, hey, that was interesting for Michael in Matthew 23 and Matthew 15. There might be some other interesting things in this Hebrew Matthew. So I start reading it from the beginning, and look what I found. Look what I find. It's really cool. And and this ties into what we started out with talking about the name. So here's an image from Matthew chapter one, verses 18 to 25. And it, you know, and if you could read medieval Hebrew, you can read this. It's, it's, it's an unusual script if you're not familiar with it. But right over here, you have uh, this symbol, which is the symbol hay. And it appears twice. And this hay uh, over here and over here, what this represents is the name Hashem. Now, remember, mm -hmm. this was copied by a rabbi. Meaning, if, if you believe what we're told in ancient sources, it was written by Matthew in Hebrew. We're told that by Papias, right, a right. church father who died in the year 130, who tells us that Matthew collected the words in the Hebrew language and each translated them as he was able. So what, what happened is Matthew wrote this in Hebrew. At some point, it, it, it's brought over into the synagogue. And you think, how did this get into synagogues? Well, what happened is the Catholic Church came along and started persecuting Jews who believed in Yeshua. So where are they gonna hide? So they hide among the other Jews and they bring their manuscripts with them. Over the centuries, they assimilate and this now is being copied by a Jewish rabbi. When the Jewish rabbi sees God's name, yud heh vav -Hey, outside of the Old Testament, it's very rare for him to ever write yud heh vav -Hey. It happens occasionally, but it's very rare. Normally, instead of writing yud heh vav -Hey, he uses a symbol to represent the name and that symbol is usually a hey with a line over it, which is exactly what we see here. So right. coming back to the name, I'm looking... Years ago, in the New Testament in Hebrew, and I see the name of the Father, yud heh vav -Hey. Well, in the Greek, it doesn't appear. In the Greek, you have kurios, which right. is Lord, and you have theos, right. which is God, but you never have the actual name yud heh vav -Hey. and I'm not even here talking about the issue of the vowels, just the tetragrammaton, the personal name of the God of Israel, revealed in Exodus 3.15, appears 6,827 times in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, appears zero times in the New Testament until we find this Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And I say, wait, what's that doing there? The name was in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. And, and then everything started to make sense. So there's a Dead Sea Scroll that was discovered at a place called Nachal Hever. And it's the Septuagint in Greek. It's the Old Testament in Greek. But when it comes to the name of God, it doesn't say kurios in the earliest, these earliest copies of the Septuagint. It says yud hey vav hey, the tetragrammaton in Hebrew. So you're reading this document in Greek and all of a sudden you see a Hebrew word. Well, what happened is as Christians started to copy the Septuagint, they didn't know how to read the Hebrew or write the Hebrew. And then it was replaced with Lord, which by that time had become a Jewish tradition. But originally it, it seems that this, from this evidence here, and we'll get into some other exciting things that, that I discovered, um, maybe in the second half of this episode, if you'll let me, there's other really exciting things, New Testament, other New Testament documents that I came across. Oh, that, no, that, no, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Okay, okay. I've been waiting for 18 years because you told me when you found these other Hebrew manuscripts of these other gospels, yeah. you said, I can't release it I, and we can't say anything about it. And I said, I said, don't tell me what they are. That way I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's the answer I can give to everyone. I've been waiting 18 years for this, Nehemiah. But now we can release them. <laughs> this is really and, exciting. And, and, you've, and you've got them. So the, it, it's uh, really the, exciting. But anyway, Michael, I want to look at something here before we, we uh, um, uh, wrap up the first part here. So what made George Howard think that this was an original Hebrew document, not just a translation from Greek? So here we have Matthew chapter one, and we can see here uh, what it says in the Greek is uh, chapter one, verse 21, she'll bring forth a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And it's really interesting. I'll ask Christian groups around the world, I'll say, do you know what the name Jesus means? And a lot of them will have no idea and you know, some of them will say, oh, it means salvation, which isn't entirely accurate. It's, it's true, but it's only half true. Uh, now, if you look in the mm -hmm. Hebrew Matthew, what it says is she will call his name, you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save my people from their iniquities. And the Hebrew word for Ye uh, Yeshua, or the name there is Yeshua, and the three words in English, he will save, 
translate a single word in Hebrew, this word Yoshia. So why is he called Yeshua? Because Yoshia, he will save. And that makes perfect sense in Hebrew because the name Yeshua itself is a contraction of two Hebrew words. And those two Hebrew words are Yehovah, the name of the Father, mm-hmm. Yoshia, he will save. And, uh, and so, you know, I mean, some people have pointed in, in, in the New Testament where it talks about he comes in his Father's name and his Father's name is in him. And that's actually literally true that the name Yeshua has in it the name Yehovah, Yehovah Yoshia, Yehovah will save or Yehovah saves. And so, and it gets even more exciting. I don't think I'll have time to get to it right now. But so this name Yeshua is itself a shortened form of Yehoshua, which is the name Joshua. And there were people in the Old Testament who had this name. Joshua, the son of Nun, was the first man ever to be called Yehoshua. His name originally was Hosea, he saves. And Moses decided, you know what? Now that we've been taken out of Egypt, my servant Hosea, I'm gonna change his name to be more specific about who saves and he called uh-huh. him Yehoshua, Yehovah saves. And then Yehoshua, Joshua, the son of Nun, in Nehemiah chapter 8, 17, my favorite book, the book of Nehemiah, because I wrote it. No, <laughs> in that book, he is then called Yeshua. So there's no question mm-hmm. whatsoever, Jesus of Nazareth in his day was known as Yeshua. Now we can go right back to the time when nobody called him Jesus Christ. They his called name- him They called him Yeshua HaMashiach. Right, right. When Bible scholars discovered a Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, it changed everything. A Hebrew Gospel written by a Hebrew disciple had researchers begging the question, could there be others? What you're about to see is is what we've been waiting for for centuries. To, to have in our hands. Michael Rood and Nehemia Gordon detail a literary revelation never seen in the history of Bible research, lost treasures in the Vatican. Nehemia is going to show us several manuscripts of several different books here, and this will be the first time that it has ever been seen in, in, the, in, the, in the outside world since uh, these things were hidden hundreds of years ago. Get this paradigm-shattering four-episode teaching that is changing the understanding of the Bible itself. Plus, a controversial bonus episode banned from broadcast. Lost treasures in the Vatican. Order now. 18 years ago, when I called Nehemia Gordon and asked him to come over to the house to help me solve my problem uh, concerning Matthew 23, uh, and uh, as I uh, read it to him, the, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe to observe, that observe and do. And I told him that uh, every extent Greek text says the same thing. And I was just, I was, uh, I was out. I, I had nowhere to turn on this. But I told him that this could not be what Yeshua said. And uh, for the next couple of hours, we went through all the passages in the Gospels where it shows Yeshua deliberately and vehemently violating the man-made rules of the Pharisees. And, and here at the end of his life, just before the crucifixion, he's telling the multitude and his disciples everything they tell you to do and observe, that you must do and observe. Well, I had at that time, and I had notes, I was showing Nehemiah my notes from uh, uh, back before then uh, of, the, uh, of the Hebrew manuscript right here and where it was from, and, but unfortunately, I couldn't read Hebrew, and especially the way Nehemiah can as he delves into these things. Nehemiah, uh, tell, tell us more about the, the Hebrew Matthew because th- yeah. this is where um, my, my question was what prompted you, and, and you hadn't heard about the Hebrew Matthew. Oh, no. You know, I, as a Jewish that, scholar, that, that Hebrew wasn't University, something I, I really even had any interest in. You know, and you, yeah, right, you know. right. This is my problem. Right. This is not your problem. Right. So, I have to do everything the Pharisees say right. to do. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, so, so, but once I started looking at this Hebrew Matthew, I'm like, wow. So I, I started this looking for something to help you answer your problem in Matthew 23. And as I mentioned in the previous segment, I then find the name of, of God, the God of the Old Testament, is there 
in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter one and in other places as well. So I'm actually learning something about my own Jewish history by looking at this document that's supposed to be a Christian book, but it's not, it's a Jewish book. Well, can, and, can you tell us, uh, George yeah. Howard was the mm-hmm. one that, that published mm-hmm. uh, the, the Hebrew Matthew, that, yeah. that version, and yeah. that was what I was reading, but right, right. then I was reading his English translation, right. but so, I find out from you that well, he, so I, he so I call pulled it, a Howard. Yeah, I call it pulling a Howard. So he had on one side of the page, he had the Hebrew, and I'm just reading the Hebrew. And the other side of the page, he has the English. And in the English, he doesn't translate what's in the Hebrew. He translates what's in the Greek that's not even on the page. And right. like, for example, in the passage of Matthew 23, instead of uh, he says, which is what it says in oh, the okay, Hebrew yeah, text. Give, give the, whole, the whole context, right? the whole so, line. So it says, all, uh, all there for, uh, here, let, let me read it to you. It says, um, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all there for whatsoever they bid you observe that and visit and do. Uh, okay, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so the word is yom, yomar, he says, meaning the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, do therefore do all that he says. And, right, he, and, which is and, and it says Moses. it is plain, it's Moses in the context. How do I know, by the way, it's not the seat? Because Hebrew has masculine and feminine for all uh, nouns, and seat is feminine, so it would have to be she says if... Because that, that was one of the arguments of some people saying, no, 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 this, the Pharisees really do sit in the seat of Moses. The he there, the singular, is referring to the seat, but it can't be. That, that would be she says. In any event, so uh, Howard has Yomar, he says, on the right side of the page, or I forget <laughs> which side, and the other side of the page he has in parentheses, they say, which is not what it says in the Hebrew. It's what it says in the Greek. So why did he do that? And presumably he came across this and he says, well, this doesn't make any sense. I can't translate the Hebrew. But me coming from a Jewish perspective reading this, it made perfect sense, right? So, in, so then I realized if Howard missed that, what else did he miss? And I start looking for other things. And one of the things I decided to do, and this is just basic for me, right? You have nine manuscripts. There's gotta be more manuscripts. I had access to things Howard didn't have access to. <clears throat> so I start looking for more manuscripts and I very quickly find four, that there's 14 manuscripts that are known. Right, so maybe in Howard's day they weren't known, but by the time I was looking about eight, 18 or 17 years ago when I was looking for the more manuscripts, there were more, there was 14 known, and I'm like, well, there's gotta be more than 14. So then I start digging and picking and um, end up finding more and more manuscripts, and uh, at one point I had exhausted all of my resources, meaning I'm looking through catalogs and, and all these old books, and, and pulling up, and really what you had to do back then is you would write on a little piece of paper the number of a microfilm, and you'd hand that piece of paper to the librarian, and he'd come back five, 10 minutes later, and he'd give you a microfilm, and you'd spool it out and look at it, and then this analog reader, very primitive, very difficult, took a huge amount of time to just get anything done. And I decide, you know what, there's all these microfilms that are listed as miscellaneous. How do I know what's in those? Maybe mm. those have a segment mm. of Hebrew Matthew, and some of them did. <laughs> and so I'm pulling these microfilms, and okay, I might... Okay, now this, this is at, at Hebrew University. Well, at the National right. Library of Israel, which is part of the Hebrew University Library, they have uh, tens of thousands of microfilms. What they did is they sent people out to libraries around the world, and they said, we want to photograph your manuscript and then make a microfilm of that so that people in Jerusalem can see the manuscript that's in Oxford. They can see the manuscript that's in Russia. Mm -hmm. They can see the manuscript in New York by just going to one central location. This is before everything went online. So back then, you had to go, and and I'm talking back then was just a year ago this was the case. You had to go, (laughs) I mean, it's not that long ago. Back in the days of yours. Back in the ancient days before everything went online. you had to go to the National Library of Israel and pull these, these microfilms and look at them on this analog reader. Um, now, a lot of these things are online in the last year. Um, but, but back then, in the ancient days, you'd be looking at the, and, and I'll tell you, most of the things I look at had nothing to do with Hebrew Matthew, right? It wasn't like everything was a jackpot, right? I'd pull a mic- microfilm that said miscellaneous, and I'd find, okay, it's something with, to do with Maimonides. Another one, yeah, that's the Mishnah. Another one, that's some rabbinical treatise on the Kabbalah, right? And there are thousands so, of these oh, to look through. Th- th- I mean, yeah. I haven't even looked through everything. I'll tell you the truth, there's probably more manuscripts. I have not looked through everything. But I looked through more and more and, and found some interesting things. And one of the things I found was actually after we had done a tour together in 2005 when I found the, the final two manuscripts, and I had heard you teach the same thing. I believe it was... We, we did 42 s- venues, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, um, I think so. Something like that. 
And, um, and, and every night for for yeah, months, right. and uh, and we together taught about four hours a night. Right. Well, yeah, four and, to and, five and it was and it was all together. I, I calculated it once. It was forty two venues and twelve weeks. So it was very dense as well. And 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 you didn't do the same thing every night because I think we were doing like two different teachings that were alternating. But I heard that over twenty times. The same teaching that you were teaching about the genealogy in Matthew chapter one. And uh, of course, the, this is an age old problem. Matthew mm-hmm. 1 yeah. gives the genealogy of Joseph in, in one way, and then Luke gives it in a different way. And ancient Christians were dealing with this problem. I actually did some interesting research and found out that this really bothered the Christians. They're like, wait a minute, our claim here is that, that Yeshua is, is, is the adopted son of Joseph, and we're giving Joseph's genealogy, and they don't line up, Matthew and, and Luke. Anybody who reads it is going to see immediately they're completely different genealogies. Uh, yeah. Both going back to David, but through different routes. And so one of the solutions that they gave him, really creative, we call this uh, uh, intellectual uh, acrobatics in Hebrew. We call it shminiot ba'avil. And uh, I mean, it's- Actually, it's, a Hebrew <laughs> term for it. Yeah, well, I mean, it literally means in Hebrew, it's like when, the, when those biplanes make the eights in the air. Like, this is what they're doing. It's these intellectual acrobatics to try to figure this out. What they were saying is, for example, well, Joseph's father uh, was actually- uh, married to his uh, uncle's widow. In other words, it was a leveret marriage. Right. And so one genealogy is for his uncle and one is for his, his biological father, right? One is for his, his, his genealogy father, which is his uncle, and the other is for his biological father. Okay, but it doesn't say that anywhere. You guys just made that up, right? Mm-hmm. And if you want to say that, fine. So you had a different solution based on the Aramaic, which I heard over 20 times, can you tell the people about that, like what the Aramaic solution is? And then I'll explain how the Hebrew comes in, which, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I yeah. think and, changes everything. And this is uh, very important. This is yeah. a, a question that was posed to me uh, over 20 years ago, uh, first time I, I came into Jerusalem, and a rabbi mm. handed me a, a sheet of paper, which really? I still have, and it's a, a $10,000 reward for any Christian who can an, uh, answer all of these problems or contradictions mm-hmm. in the New Testament. Mm. And I thought, this is a coincidence, I could use $10,000 right now uh, <laughs> because I, my, my uh-huh. room was broken into, I was robbed the night before. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and uh, uh, but the, the question number 10, um, that, that was a real mm-hmm. stumper. And I went back to one of the rabbis that, that actually was involved, a Jewish lawyer was that, was, uh, uh, that was involved in this. Yeah. And uh, uh, I said, it took me an entire week to answer the first nine, it took me 17 years okay. <laughs> to answer the last one. Uh-huh. Uh, show from the Christian Bible that Yeshua is any blood relative of King David. Mm-hmm. Interesting. They know the problem. Interesting. They know the problem. Uh-huh. And yet we have, you know, lever, in, in other words, all these things that, that yeah. you just mentioned, yeah. they don't qualify, and right. and they so, know so, it. But, you're, but you're actually you're actually bringing well, that's that's an interesting thing. You're you're saying there's another problem from a Jewish perspective, which is that the genealogy in Matthew and the genealogy in Luke both are presented as genealogies of Joseph. So even if you can reconcile them with some clever explanation like the uh, lever at marriage, they're still not. No, there's still no blood relative of Yeshua. Right, wow, right. That, that's a really interesting right. yeah, part of that. Yeah. And, and so there, there's no way with, mm-hmm. with what we had to, to answer that, yeah. except for in the Aramaic, yeah. it says that, that uh, uh, jo- Joseph uh, was, uh, first of all, we have uh, Joseph, who is the son of Yaakov, who mm-hmm. is the uh, Givra, the, the, the mighty mm-hmm. man of mm-hmm. Mary. Yeah. And they translated into King James. Uh, it came translated into Greek as uh, Aner, which is just mm-hmm. a man of full age. Uh, but it just uh, it tra- translated mm-hmm. as husband of Miriam. Yeah. And later on, it does say that Joseph, the husband of Miriam, mm-hmm. uh, in, in verse 17. Right. But we we don't have the 14 generations that mm-hmm. Matthew says we have. Mm-hmm. We only have 13 generations. And if Joseph mm-hmm. is the husband of Miriam, and I said that it had to be, uh, as it is in Aramaic, uh, Givra, uh, that has to be translated as father. Mm-hmm. That, that's, what, that's what I said. And, yeah. and you, you weren't convinced of this well, at all. You were, I, you're, so so it's, it's one of those things where, you know, could you translate, because Givra or Givra is, means something like man, right? 
and man in a generic sense in, in, um, in Semitic languages means husband. And right, there isn't actually a word for husband and wife in Semitic languages. There's man and woman, right? In Hebrew, it's ish isha, man and woman. In Aramaic, it's, it's uh, similar. It's uh, guvra and intata. So, so it's, they just mean man and woman, right? So if you saw the word man in a context like this, it, it really would be a stretch to, tr to say, well, it's, it's a man and we're not saying which man and we're saying it's the father. That's kind of a stretch to me. So I wasn't convinced. Okay. But I was looking for more manuscripts of, of the Hebrew Matthew because I had found at that point, I believe 26. Um, and like I said, many of these were, you know, you throw something at the wall to see what sticks. You pull out a, a microfilm, you spend an hour looking through it. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with Matthew. You move on to the next one. And you do this day after day. And then you do find stuff. If you, if you put in enough time and effort, you can find stuff that, that you, you, know, you wouldn't expect to find. Well, I'm looking through. And here I, you know, there I am looking at this manuscript. And, it, and it's a single page. And it only has the genealogy for Matthew chapter 1. And it's a manuscript from the Oxford, uh, from the Oxford University Bodleian Library. And I'm looking at it. And... Um, and really what I'm doing is cataloging what I found, right? So when you find one of the, when I find one of these sections of Hebrew Matthew, I say, okay, it's may not, most of them aren't complete. So, all right, it starts in chapter one, verse one, and it goes to chapter 12, verse two, right? And so I'm cataloging, I'm saying, okay, what's the first verse, what's the last verse? And as I look at the last verse, I see where it says, Yosef, Avi Miriam, Joseph, the father of Miriam. Meaning, meaning what you had speculated as, a, as essentially an interpretation of the Aramaic is said explicitly in the Hebrew Matthew in this one manuscript, and it's incontrovertibly saying without any question that here in Matthew is Joseph, the, the genealogy of Joseph, the father of Miriam. In other words, Miriam married a man named Joseph but also had a father named Joseph. Right. That's the solution that right. you that you were suggesting as a as essentially as an interpretation. And in my view, it was a stretch of an interpretation. But here, there's no interpretation. It's explicit. Joseph, the father of Miriam, in this Hebrew document. And then, of course, I'm looking for more manuscripts, and I find a second witness. And that is there a manuscript is. that was in the JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. They had a manuscript that said the exact same thing. And can we show this to the people? Uh, so, yeah, th so, this is it. So here, so this is the manuscript. And at the end of the line here, it says, Yosef, Avi, Miriam, Joseph, the father of Miriam. Now, when I discovered this years ago, I, I, did, I don't know if I should say this. So I did something I wasn't supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> maybe I won't say. I had a photo that I wasn't supposed to have. Um, but it was really low resolution. <laughs> you it gave was, it to somebody that wasn't supposed to have it. Right. Okay, I, I won't go into details. But basically, it was, it, was, it was a horrible low resolution photo. Now, for the first time ever, as of literally yesterday, I have, because we were sitting down talking about what are we going to share with the people. And you said, Nehemi, you found the thousand manuscripts with the name because all these manuscripts are online. Is the Joseph Father of Mary manuscript on my line? And I said, I don't know. I didn't look. So we looked and it was. <laughs> we, now we have uh, a high resolution. This one is in grayscale. It's, it's much better quality image than what we had before. And you can clearly see. If you read Hebrew, it's oh, as yeah. clear as day. As we, we print saying, this out, you can see the, the, the fibers. Oh, and the other one is in color. You can actually see like wrinkles in the, in the leather that it's written on in the parchment. It's unbelievable. Yeah, you see like where there were fibers and, and wrinkles in the leather. It's of that high quality this color photograph from Oxford University. And, and now what, you know, back in the day, <laughs> not that long ago, I had to, you know, pull the microfilm and show you black and white and try to, you know, try to do something with it. Now these are available at the click of a button to anybody who at least knows how to find it, right? Which that's not so yeah. small thing either. But well, what, I, yeah. what I love that you're going to be doing is sharing this with people on television where they can see for themselves, don't believe the Jew from Jerusalem that it's there in the manuscript, the Hebrew manuscript, you can see it for yourself. I love that we live in this period of history that we can now get this, I mean, when we hear about this in Daniel, it talks about how knowledge will increase. And I believe, right. Michael, yeah, yeah. that we Amen. are in this period of knowledge increasing where we don't have to rely on what it says in the encyclopedia. We can actually go and see the original text for ourselves, the original sources. That's such a powerful thing. Look, I've said this many times, Michael. I was born and raised in Illinois. 
but in my heart, I'm from Missouri, which is the show me state. I wanna see it with my own two eyes. And today we live in this period where I can pull this up on the computer and I can show you where it says it. And you can see the, the, the fibers and the, and the imperfections in the ink. And you can see where, where you know, I mean, look, and, and the, 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 I mean, there's two miracles here. One is that this manuscript survive. The other is that I found it, right? Because this is one of 90,000 manuscripts. This is a single page out of 90,000 manuscripts. A single page. And that is all of the, the Hebrew math that exists in that In that manuscript, right. In, in that so, manuscript. And you have to understand how, what happened is in the Middle Ages, the Jewish manuscripts were a little different than Christian manuscripts. Christian manuscripts had official centers where they would be copied. What would happen with Jewish manuscripts is you'd have a rich Jew who was usually a merchant or a doctor, and he would go to a scribe and say, you know, um... I want to study, uh, make, me, make me a collection of books that I can study. And so they'd put 10 pages of Maimonides and 20 pages of the Talmud and, you know, five pages of, of the Hebrew New Testament, right? I mean, that, that kind of thing happened, right? Mm -hmm. And in this page, in this instance, he has one page of the Hebrew New Testament. Why does he have that? You know, maybe the guy wasn't that interested in this topic, right? And, and so the scribe would, you know, he had a bunch, of, bunk, a bunch of books on his shelf and he'd pull out the book and he'd say, okay, my, my um, patron who, who ordered this manuscript isn't really interested in the New Testament so much. I'm just gonna copy one page from my source, put that back on the shelf. Now some pages from Maimonides. And I mean, th that's very typical. So that's why you have many, many manuscripts in, in Jewish um, uh, in collections of Hebrew manuscripts around the world in libraries where it'll say miscellaneous. And God only knows, literally in some cases, what's in those miscellaneous documents. There could be more. Now, can I share something with the people that I discovered while I was doing this? So, so while uh, I was, I, 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 I just got to tell them the, 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 oh, main, okay. the main part, uh, okay? Okay, okay. So I'm looking for more manuscripts of Hebrew Matthew, Matthew. I ultimately find 28. I'm sure there's more out there, so I keep looking, and I'm pounding away, pounding away, pounding away, looking at these microfilms, and I pull out this microfilm from the Vatican. And as I'm looking through, I'm saying, wow, this is a really strange combination of documents. There's a page here from a, uh, a book that, that from a children's book. There's another page from a book on Kabbalah and they're not from the same scribe. What I was describing before those miscellaneous collections is a single scribe. He had a bunch of books on his shelf and he copied different sections into a manuscript for, for a patron. Well, this is different. These are loose pages, usually two to four pages. And it'll be, there's you know, two pages of a book in German, a printed book in German. Most of these are Hebrew documents. From, and you can see by the writing style, they're different scribes from different centuries. And I'm going through, and all of a sudden, I find a page from a Hebrew gospel, and it's not Matthew. Now, let me, let me explain again what I'm talking about. This is a, so there's miscellaneous pages in this box in the Vatican. And somebody from Jerusalem said, hey, I've been sent here to, to make photographs and microfilms of everything in your collection. So and this is literally uh, like, like a junk box. It's a junk box. Uh, it's literally a junk box. In the box. Vatican yeah. of manuscripts. They don't know what they are. Well, just a page here and there. These manuscripts are in the Vatican for centuries and a page falls out and they find it in the, in the bookshelf or they find it on the floor and they say, where does this go? We don't have a computerized database you know, centuries ago to find out where this page goes. Put it in the junk box. And this goes on for centuries where these pages build up. And, so, and now there's hundreds and hundreds of pages in the junk box in the Vatican. And so decades ago, an Israeli scholar goes there, a photographer, and he takes photographs and brings it back. He doesn't know what's in the box. He doesn't care what's in, his bo in the box. His job was to just get photographs of everything. So he photographs the junk box, and I'm looking through it around uh, 2001 or so, and I find in the junk box bunch of things that have nothing to do with anything I'm interested in, and all of a sudden I find a page from a Hebrew gospel, which isn't Matthew. Well, Can I tell the people what it is, or do we have to wait no, for a few episodes? We, we, we have to wait on that, because I want you to read it. So, so you'll let me read it to the people? Read it. I want you to put it on the screen and read it. So okay, every, I'm excited. So everyone can see what was in the junk box at the Vatican and, and this is... So, uh, spoiler the, alert, it's four pages from the Gospels, uh, and they're not Matthew. I won't say okay, what they are all right, yet. All right. but, but I've been waiting around 17 years to share this publicly. I, I, and I, right, and I, I, I've been waiting for that long for you to tell me right. what you found. Well, and, and, and I told you I had found it, but what I didn't want to do was create a situation where, where, where I didn't actually have 
Now, now these photos are on the Vatican website and I have high resolution color photos. So now we've got it in our hands, right? So, you know, I mean- It can't disappear. It can't disappear from the junk box anymore and end up in somebody's living room or their, or their garage. And if it does, it doesn't matter. I've got the high resolution photographs to show people. And so I'm really excited about this, that you're gonna let me share this. I've been, I've been literally waiting for, to, for, 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 I mean, since like around 2001 to share this with people. It's really exciting stuff. It was uh, uh, at uh, Albuquerque when you shared the photograph with me about uh, Yosef V. Miriam. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I left there, I said, now I go to print with the Chronological Gospels. Oh, wow. And uh, that's why the Chronological Gospels, because mm -hmm. that's why I say it took 17 years to answer that mm -hmm. one question uh, that the rabbis asked and, uh, and so it is printed. I actually had the photographs yeah. of the photograph that, that you gave me, you know, and it's in here so yeah. people can read it on their own yeah. because, see, uh, in this, I contend that I have solved all the apparent contradictions mm. that are in mm. the English New Testament, mm. in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it, takes a, it took me uh, mm. 38 years wow. to do it. <laughs> and so it was a, a long, project, but oh, when you gave me that piece, I knew, oh, this is it. Mm -hmm. And so now it is available, uh, the photograph of it, uh, it's available in the Chronological Gospels, and even the large print, it's available for everyone uh, to participate uh, in that discovery. Uh, but we're going to have Nehemiah come back, and I want you to now share with us what's in the Vatican junk box, and uh, uh, there's more than the Gospel of Matthew. There's, uh, you're, you're gonna see some things, and I'm gonna have Nehemiah uh, read it, translate it on the air, and so I want you to get your Bibles out, get ready, because you can mark in your Bibles uh, the accuracy of what is in the Hebrew, uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say it. Uh, what, what, what is in uh, these other texts. So, uh, uh, Nehemiah, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for this uh, beginning of this update. Yeah. Uh, I, I know there's just a, a volume of information mm -hmm. that you have for us, but if you would uh, close this particular session in, yeah. in, uh, with the Aaronic blessing. For sure. Yehovah, Vinu Shabbat Shemayim, Yehovah, our Father in heaven, please bless all the people around the world who are watching this, this time when knowledge is increasing, put your blessing upon all the people who want that knowledge, who thirst for that knowledge. May he give you peace. Amen. Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom to our fans. Shavua Tov, have a good week, and we'll see you back here next week with Nehemia Gordon as we reveal the other Hebrew Gospels. Shalom. Bye-bye.